Yes. I want to take a moment to welcome our guests who are tuning in from around the world, from Brazil to Fort Mill to China to Charlotte, and to our guests here at TC. Welcome, 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 welcome. Let's give it up for the mighty men and beautiful women of all of our correctional facility partnerships. We believe in you. We love you. And to the TZ family, welcome, welcome, welcome. So we're continuing our series, Turn. And so we're going to learn how to turn from death to life. Here's an example of what I mean. It is time for some of our dead marriages to live. It is time for some of our teenagers to want to live. And it is time for some of those God-shaped, God-birthed dreams in you to walk out of that tomb of hopelessness and to live. Because there's something in you that God wants to do specifically through you, but in the words of James Brown, you got to get on up and come out of that tomb. The God of resurrection is calling your name, and he's saying, turn from life to death. Now, if you think the way I think, you're going, uh, uh, Pastor, if I was dead, I wouldn't like be here or wouldn't be watching. Yeah, you're right, you are alive, but there are two types of life described, particularly in the New Testament. The first life is called bios. That's just a Greek word where we get the English word biology. All of us have that biology, but we're created for a higher, deeper life that Jesus says this. He says, you must be born again. For those of you not too familiar with the Bible, Jesus is having a conversation with a religious leader. His name is Nicodemus. He went to see Jesus at night, so I've nicknamed him Nick at night. So Nick at night comes to Jesus, and he's asking Jesus about the kingdom of God and what he must do. And Jesus says, no, no, the kingdom of God is so precious, there's nothing you can do, but you have to be born again. And that's the Greek word zoe, and zoe means God's kind of life. It doesn't mean we become God. It means this, that God gives us his life. So resurrection life is not just for when we die physically. Resurrection life is God's life now so we can learn how to live. And so God wants us to be born again. He wants us to turn from death to life. But before we turn from death to life, we've got to turn from death to mercy and love. On the count of three, will you say mercy with me? One, two, three, mercy. Uh, We live in a culture where I have never seen it, particularly in American context, where we lack so much mercy. Now, I'm not talking about people who don't follow Jesus. Um, I used to not follow Christ for 26 years of my life, and I know what that's like. So I don't expect people like I used to be to follow Jesus. Now, the shocker is, is when people who say they follow Jesus lack mercy. You're going, preacher, how you know? Because I read your Facebook page. I mean, you be wilding out on that thing. (laughs) God gives us mercy, so not only can we be in tune, in touch, in relationship with him, but so that we can be merciful. An eye for an eye makes everybody blind. And so God wants us to turn from death to mercy and love. Death is not just physical death, but it's also spiritual death. Death. So how do we turn from mercy and love? Let's, let's journey with our man, the Apostle Paul, right here. So this is from Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. Now, contrary to popular belief, um, Ephesians is not a skin disorder that can get rid of by hydrocortisone. Okay? Ephesians was actually a book written to the church at Ephesus, which is now modern-day Turkey, and it was a church a lot like ours. There were all types of people from all types of backgrounds, different ethnicities, different cultures, different socioeconomic classes, rich, poor, 
middle class, everybody. And Paul's like, okay, let me remind you why Jesus rescued you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Let me remind you why Jesus gave you resurrection life. And it's so that we could be the people of God on earth displaying how beautiful and how wonderful and great he is. And when that happens, that's when we find joy. But he reminds us of some things. So teenagers, check this out. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 starts this way. It says, and you were. So the you here is speaking to Jews and Gentiles, but it's also speaking to us, every human being ever born. And you were dead. So when we come out of our mother's womb, we're like in a spiritual hearse. Like we're all spiritually dead. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. The word trespass in the Greek literally means to fall off on the side of the road. Jesus says, here's the way to God. Well, you and I are like, Frank Sinatra, we're going to do it our way. We're, we're, we're going to go in our own direction. And it says, dead in our trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world. So, Paul lays this out. Every human being is born spiritually dead. You're going, Pastor, how do you know? I shared this last week. How is it that children, first words are no in mine. Why is it that we have to teach character values in school? Because we're broken. And if you don't believe me, if I could interview and we could talk the brokenness in our own families, in our own lives, even right now, there's desperation and brokenness. It's a reality. And the ways of this world simply means this, any thoughts or way of living that's contrary to the way of love in the kingdom of God. Now, what I'm about to do next here, and I'm not cussing, so don't send me an email, but I want to scare you out of hell right now, okay? Uh, did y'all see the word play there? I want to scare you out of hell right now. So Paul is laying this out like, not only are you dead, following the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. That is Hebrew language for dark demonic powers. So listen, there are dark demonic powers in this world, teenagers, that want to destroy you. They want you to get sucked into social media and compare yourself and never feel like you are enough. There are dark powers that want to destroy marriages. They're dark powers that want you to be corrupt politicians and business leaders. The king of darkness only gives darkness and death. Jesus says it this way. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give life and to give it to its fullest. So the situation is looking pretty, pretty bleak right now. The spirit now working in the diso. Obedient. This was my life for 26 years of my existence. Check out verse 3. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. This is what I love about the Apostle Paul. Notice he says we. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not a follower of Christ yet, I just want you to chill. Followers of Christ, we should be the most humble, merciful, forgiving people on the planet. We should be the less judgmental people on the planet because we understand that Jesus jumped into a pit and saved us. There's nothing to boast about. There's nothing to brag about. There's no arrogance. If not by the grace of God, you can only boast when you've done something to make yourself worthy to God. People who don't follow Jesus should love us because they find the fragrance of mercy and kindness and goodness. Why? because we remember who we used to be. Goes on, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were, were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. Now this part right here needs a little, as the young people say, finessing. So let me finesse it just a wee bit. Um, if you're new here, I'm a equal opportunity offender. I even offend myself sometimes. So, so I want to talk to my friends on the progressive left here. The desire to seek justice is God's desire first. But it's amazing that people will go, that was wrong, that needs to be judged, but yet they don't believe God will judge sin. 
So you want to judge injustice, but when God wants to judge, and oh, God is loving, he'll never judge. No, 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 no. God is loving, but it is a holy love. And if we don't think God is serious about sin, look at the cross. The cross magnifies that God is going to deal with sin and injustice. But he allows Jesus to deal with it in our place if we allow him to be his substitute. Imagine someone wrecking your house and destroying it. You want justice. Well, we've wrecked each other. We've wrecked God's creation. And God must exercise judgment, but his holy love says, not only am I the judge, but I'm going to take the judgment in your place if you allow me. So this is our condition. Woo we, Man, I'm so glad verse 4 came, y'all, and it could not come fast enough. But God. Woo! If you're new to Transformation Church, this may blow your mind a little bit, but I got to say it. Every time I see but in the Bible, I got to remind you of this. God loves big butts and he cannot lie. <laughs> Satan may try to deny. When you see but in the Bible, God is about to do something big. So think of our condition. We are dead. We are under the power of the darkness. We are under judgment. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy cannot tell you about the bank account of God's mercy. It was not affected by cryptocurrency. It was not affected by inflation or COVID or anything man-made. God's mercy is unending. It is in infinite, it is shoreless, it is boundless, and you can drink from its well, and it'll never go down. Mercy, teenagers, is God saying, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. Mercy. Because of this, his great love, he's merciful because he has great love. Not a little love, but great love that he had for us. Here's our biggest fundamental problem. You ready? This is some strong medicine. We think some human is going to love us like Jesus. Christian parents, we do our kids a disservice when we tell them that marriage is the highest thing of being a Christian. It is not at all. The highest point of being a Christian is Jesus. I love my wife, but she can't love me like Jesus. I love my wife, but she can't do me like Jesus. I love my wife, and she loves me, but I can't love her like Jesus. No human being can love me like Jesus. My mama can't. My grandma can't. Can't nobody love me with an infinite, unconditional, never giving up, never abandoning, life-giving love. That's the love he's called us to experience. And listen, young ones, Gen Z, millennials, there are going to be some things that happen in your life that are going to make you question if God loves me. When that moment happens, remember the cross. The cross echoes throughout eternity. I love you. I'm entering into your pain and forgiving not only your sin, but the cross heals all of creation. Verse 5, he's merciful, great love, and what else? He made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. What's interesting, the way this word is constructed in the Greek language, it means a past action with a future guarantee and present reality. In other words, when Jesus saves you because of mercy and grace and forgives you, he doesn't stop saving you. He doesn't let you go. He doesn't run away. He is present and present and present. He's a God who continues to hold you near. Uh, let me introduce you to this young cat right here. So this dude right here, uh, by the way, today's my 52nd birthday. And so, yeah. So, uh, I mean, what better gift on your birthday than to preach the gospel? And, and, and so let me introduce you to this guy right here. This is like 1994. So I was probably, I don't know, 23, 24. And, and, and so that's the poster child of the American dream. Come from the ghetto. I don't know how poor we were until I grew up. And I was like, dang, we were poor. Mom was 17. Dad was 19. They both had issues. So my grandmother primarily raised me. Um, 
First one to graduate high school, go to college. First one not to ever be arrested or be in a police car. First one not to have a child outside of marriage. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Go to college, meet a girl, get married, have a great career, get drafted to the NFL. So it's like, man, you made it. But here's the thing, though. You can paint the outside of a barn, but what makes the barn the barn is what's on the inside and the foundation to keep it up. So my outside was painted really, really good, but my insides were deteriorating because I always wanted to be loved. And when you're really good at something, you have the illusion that people actually love you. Football fans, you don't love those players. You love the fantasy football points they give you. (laughs) Think about this. Joe Montana, the greatest quarterback ever, got traded from the San Francisco 49ers. Peyton Manning, other greatest quarterback ever, got cut from the Indianapolis Colts. And your favorite player, too, when he can't do whatever he can do with you anymore, you're moving on to the next one. I soon discovered that the NFL stands for not for long. But through a teammate named Steve Grant, whose nickname was the Naked Preacher because he preached half naked with a Bible in the locker room, towel around his waist with a Bible. And he would ask teammates, do you know Jesus? And then I discovered the true NFL, a new found life. And this life begins with, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, made us alive. Do you know about that great love? I'm not talking about like, you know how we think we know each other on social media? You don't know me, that's just a tweet. No, no, I mean, but, but like, do you know me? Like, do you actually know him? Or are, you, are you actually drawing life from him? Are you actually basking and reveling in his mercy and great love? If you don't, you can Let's continue. It's time to turn from death to resurrection life. All right, teenagers, I want you to watch this. This part, you just chill. Us peoples over 45 are about to have a good time. Y'all remember in 1983 when Michael Jackson, hee <laughs> hee. By the way, I always think my leg is going higher than it actually is, but it's really not. It's like one foot on the ground. I mean, it's like really... But y'all, in 1983, man, Michael Jackson hit that stage. We went crazy. That was the first time he unveiled the moonwalk, and we were all like at school the next day. Like, I mean, we was, oh, oh, y'all didn't, oh, yeah, oh, y'all didn't know? Okay, okay, okay. I mean, I don't be doing a TikTok, but I can hit you. Y'all don't even know. Let me stop. Okay, let me get back to the sermon. So the one thing about Michael Jackson is he wore the high pants in the 80s before it became fashion. 50 years later, 40 years later. So anyway, he was ahead of the curve. But one of the things Michael Jackson had the glove, y'all. Y'all know about the glittery glove. Let's watch this glittery glove do its thing. Ready? Go! Okay, hold on. (laughs) The glove can't do anything until my hand is in it. You can't do anything until Christ is in you. I don't care how glitterly you are. You don't have life until Christ is in you. So God is not only just forgiveness. Just forgiveness. What good is forgiveness if you're dead? God forgives, and when he forgives, he makes you alive. To be a person you never, ever thought was possible. Now, immediately we began to think of all these big thoughts, but but, but if what if being the person you never, ever thought was possible is you're the best third grade teacher you can be at Indian Land Elementary? What if it's that that you're someone that no one notices, but they know that you're faithful and dependable and have integrity? That, that when people come around you, they can't even explain it. They're like, I just don't know what it is. And you know it's Christ 
in you. You know when you're around somebody that is filled with the Spirit of God, it's not weird, it's not creepy. You sense a love and compassion that words can't even really explain, but you know it. Jesus is saying, I want you to live with my life in you. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God who's rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive. There it is. That's the word zoe, resurrection life, the spirit of God. He made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. Once again, listen, the book of Ephesians, Christians, was not written to non-Christians. He's writing to Christians. This is an elementary Christianity. God is saying, teenagers, listen to me. God doesn't want you to just follow rules. He wants to rule and reign in your heart with mercy and grace and goodness and love. He wants you to follow him, not because you have to, but because you're so in love with him, you want to. It's time to turn from death to grace. On the count of three, say grace with me. One, two, three, grace. Ephesians chapter two, six through 10. He also raised us up. Let's pause here. The apostle Paul right now, I imagine him writing, losing his mind. So he starts out at first like, oh man, we're dead, children of wrath, under demonic power, but God, oh my God, rich in mercy, great love, saved us by grace, made us alive. And then he goes, he also, in case that wasn't enough, he also, watch this, he also, what did he do? Raised us up with him. So when Jesus came out of that tomb, he drug me and you out with him. That a supernatural exchange took place. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Time out. When a king accomplished a victory in the ancient Near East and the Greco-Roman world. After the king won the victory, guess what he would do? He would go and sit down, boom. So when Jesus raises from the dead, right now, Jesus is the God-man, 100% God the Son, 100% man. Two distinct natures never mixing. He has to be God to die for us. He has to be man to stand in our place on the cross and represent us. And so Jesus, 100% God the Son, 100% man, is sitting down at the throne of heaven going, to Tetelestai, it is finished. Redemption has been taken care of. Death has been defeated. My people can be set free from the tyranny of sin. And Satan, your days are numbered. It is finished. He is sitting down. And guess where you sitting? Guess where you sitting? Right there with him on the throne. I know it's hard to believe. You're like, but God, I mean, I didn't deserve it. Well, that's why it's called grace. Well, I'm not good enough. That's why it's called grace. Well, I can't believe this. Well, you need to. That's why it's called grace. So here's my thing to you and me. Don't get off the throne. Stay seated in him. Watch what happens next. Why does this take place? So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace. Teenagers, immeasurable means you can't measure it so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So we're seated with Christ. The ages to come deals not only with now, but in eternity in a new heavens, new earth. He goes, I want to display my grace. Maybe this will help. Okay, so if you come to my house, which you're not, because I'm a recluse. I'm an introvert. If you're going to knock on the door, I'm going to be like, I'll, I'll see you son. Like, I'm such an introvert. You, you have no idea. If I go to parties, I'll be like, <laughs> like, it's like for me to speak on a stage is God's gift, because I am such an introvert. Been that way my whole life. So anyway, I got a room called the Dewey Room, because Dewey's my nickname. And in the Dewey Room is all my football stuff. And the older you get, you start to appreciate things that you just didn't realize. And I'm like, 
wow, I played in the NFL. That's kind of dope. So in 1992, my senior year at BYU, um, I won what's called the best condition athlete. So they take like your size, your speed, your play, how fast you are, how high you jump, and they formulate it. And so when I found about it my freshman year, I was like, I will win that before I leave this school. So first year, a dude named Chad Robinson won. It's like 6'3", 250, big Utah country strong. Next year, Alima Fatissi Manu won, and he was a Samoan, so he looked like the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Third year, big country boy from Idaho won named Jared. He was 6'4", 250. Senior year, I finally won this thing. Oh, man. So if you come to the crib, I'm going to be like, man, let me show you my stuff, and I'm going to point to this. Now, one of the things that I do when young people ask me about playing in the NFL, I say, well, before I tell you about playing in the NFL, let me tell you about running in the rain when no one was out there cheering my name. Let me tell you about the pain when no one was recruiting me. Let me tell you about the hard work when I didn't think colleges even knew I existed. Let me tell you about the hard work. Let me tell you about the four years of bench pressing and power cleaning and running and the discipline and all the things that it took. And so when I show you this, there's a whole story written in here. It's not just a plaque. It's a testimony. Well, guess what God does for you? He goes, angels. Come here. <laughs> Let me tell you about my grace in James' life. <laughs> the devil thought he had him in addiction. Ah oh, ha But I got him back. Hey, let me tell you about Samantha. Oh, the devil thought. He had her because of the difficult things at home and, and mental health and not wanting to live. Oh, but, but, but no, but I rescued her. Now she's a mental health specialist. And let me tell you about this one. And let me tell you about this one. And he's pointing to you and he's showing you off. And he's going, look what my grace has done. 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 Look at my grace has done. Look what my grace has done. He displays it for all eternity. And it's you. Guys, that's where obedience to follow Christ comes from. For some of you, it's like, oh, I gotta follow Jesus today, versus waking up going, God, I'm your trophy of grace. Wow, you've, you've forgiven me this way? Wow, you, you love me this way? See, that's what resurrection life does. Resurrection life takes your eyes off yourself and puts it on Christ. For you are saved by grace, he says it again, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it's God's gift and not from works. That means we can't earn it, we can't achieve it, we can only receive it so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Teenagers, this word workmanship is the Greek word for poem. It's a poem. It's God's artwork. So when God gives us life, when God gives us mercy, when God gives us grace, our lives become a poem of his love so the world can read it and enter into his kingdom as well. I don't think you're picking up what I'm putting down. What I'm telling you is God simply isn't rescuing you just for yourself. He is rescuing you and giving you his life so that his kingdom can come to earth as it is in heaven through you. Let me put it to you this way. He gave you mercy so we could be merciful. He gave us grace so we could be gracious. He gave us love so we could be loving. He gave us kindness so we can be kind. He gave us his power so we could be powerful. He gave us his life so we could live. He wants us to turn from death to life. Our worship team is gonna play for us. And I want you to allow the words of the song and the word of the message to deal with you. And when I come back, I'm gonna pray for us to live in resurrection life, but I'm gonna pray for those of you who are yet to follow Jesus to follow him. One of the dangerous things of living in the South is we think if we go to a church, we're a Christian. Well, if I go to a garage, I'm not a BMW. Do you know Jesus? 
Is he living through you? Do you have this sense of anxiety you're not measuring up? Well, I want to say you don't know him because he doesn't call us to measure up. He's already done it. He wants you to experience his life.